Yeah, uh, I'm on there at the back. Josh has put me back on. So, shall we come with our drinks and our recharged batteries and uh, drained reservoirs? You know what I'm referring to. Uh, so, all ready for the next session. We're going to talk about migration, the marvels of migration, amazing journeys in the natural world. Um, I've been a great lover of flight for a long time. Just to show you that I know the Red Arrows are the best uh, aerobatics team, but actually I, there is another, another country which has an aerobatic team. It's called the Blue Angels, which is not bad. They're almost as good. And I thought I'd just show you my delight in aviation. In 2015, I went to an area of San Diego and uh, I went to the Miramar um, uh, air display. Boy, was it spectacular. I, and just watch this. This is flight, which is hugely spectacular. The knife edge pass is a well-known uh, display procedure which is hugely dangerous but works and these, these, these guys have to practice and practice to get it right. There are amazing things going on in flight systems though in nature. That of course was all man-made and may I remind you that it all started with two people whose names are Wilbur and Orville Wright. The brains behind the, uh, the flying machines that you've just witnessed in 2015 at least, uh, it all started a over a hundred years before when uh, the brains of Wilbur watched the way birds were operating. And the young man on the left was Orville and uh, he was the one who actually did the first flight. Wilbur was the one who actually understood how to really build these machines, which eventually became um, the right flyer. You probably don't know the full story, but some of you may, um, that there was a bit of a race going on as to who was going to get the first heavier-than-air machine, which was in control, being controlled properly, to fly. There'd be gliders of all sorts beforehand, but who was going to get the first heavier-than-air, controllable, powered flying machine? And the Smithsonian was doing its level best to be the first. It was catapulting poor pilots on machines, which ended up be getting, <laughs> almost getting drowned, the pilots, that is, in the Potomac River. And they were doing all sorts of things, but they constantly were getting it wrong because they thought that with all the money that they had, they were bound to win. It was two brothers who weren't even aeronautical engineers, but were... Bicycle. That's right, bicycle mechanics from Ohio. Dayton in Ohio, uh, who actually managed to beat the Smithsonian. I love that point. If you want to read more about it, by the way, go and get David McCulloch's book. David McCulloch has now died, but he was a tremendously brilliant author. Had a way of gripping you. He wrote all sorts of books. I've read a number of them. He wrote the book on the, the Brooklyn Bridge and the way that was built, uh, which is still standing today, but it was built in the 1800s. Uh, he also wrote a book about uh, Theodore Roosevelt, which I found fascinating. Um, uh, the father of Ted... Uh, uh, no, the father... It's the first Roosevelt, anyway, not the second Roosevelt. Always get them confused. So, uh, and he also wrote a book about the Wright brothers. And a lot of the information I gained on the origin of flight comes from there. But what really is stunning is, of course, the first flight took 
place in North Carolina on the December the 17th, 1903, on a very cold, windy day, where Wilbur had copied all that the birds were doing and changing the camber of the wings, which I'm coming to because it's all highly relevant to the way birds migrate, which is what I'm going to be uh, emphasizing in this talk. But what I want to just briefly say is the irony of this story is that today, if you want to see the uh, restored right flyer, I believe it may just be a replica or else it's a res restoration of the first one. Where does it sit? It actually sits in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. And I find that a real irony. The, the group which had lost the battle, right, now honours the ones who beat them uh, because they frankly hadn't understood that the way to understand flight is to look at the birds. And that's the message of the Wright brothers. I think we all would do well to note this verse, which um, James Clark Maxwell had written, sadly, in Latin. I wish he'd done it in English but he had written on the door of the Cavendish Laboratories, and it's still there today, in the University of Cambridge, the proper Cambridge, the original Cambridge, not the poor copy in Massachusetts. But uh, uh, the, door of <laughs> the door of the Cavendish Laboratories, over it is written, the works of the Lord are great. Sort out of all them that have pleasure therein. The great scientists understood that, as Kepler said, and I quoted it yesterday, I think, Johann Kepler said that he felt that he was thinking God's thoughts after him. And we do well to remember that it's the Lord who has made all things well in the original creation. We live in a fallen creation, but it was, it's he who made the birds. So if you want to read my chapter on flight, just as I've got a chapter there on the bombardier beetle, go and get the book. And even if you've got the book, buy one or two others and give them out for birthday presents and Christmas presents to others. I don't want to take the books back with me. I want you to use them effectively. So let's talk about feathers briefly. I've got actually a feather here which I'd like to, uh, uh, I will show to you in a moment. I'm going to say something about real feathers. But feathers, every feather in a bird is in a unique location. Did you know that? So if I get a given bird, right, every feather is different to every other feather on a given bird, right? It even applies right down to tiny little hummingbird feathers. Those tiny little feathers, every one of them is in a specific location for a specific purpose. You've got primary, secondary, tertiary feathers. Primary are the what feathers which, if you don't have, the bird won't fly. You sometimes deliberately cut them off, not to be cruel to the bird, but to train the bird to do what you're telling it to do. We have Here's another word which you completely don't understand. We had, Juliet and I, budgerigars. But you don't even have the word budgerigar. You don't know what it is. You call them parrots, but now a parrot is a big thing, right? So you, anyway, forgetting the fact that you mess about with the words, we had what you would call a mini parrot, right? They're small, uh, budgerigars, and we call them. And my wife was very good with budgerigars, and... Uh, she, she would just cut the primary feathers and they wouldn't be able to fly. So you, you basically get them to come to you to get their food and so gradually they begin to obey your instructions. And you have then, when the, when the feathers begin to grow again, they will come to you and be able to talk to them and then they repeat things, they repeat those noises, they can begin to talk. They're not understanding, of course, what they're saying, but they 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 can talk. And so you, my son would come in and whistle and the bird would whistle back and we could talk to the bird and the bird would repeat what you said. Hello. And words like that, you know. So 
But that's, that's done in training. You cut off the primary feathers, then you've got the secondary, then you've got the tertiary. Then as you come forward, you have the covering feathers or covert feathers, the primary coverts, the greater coverts, the lesser coverts, and so on. So once you've understood that every feather is unique, and including the tail feathers, technical term is the retresses, then when you actually look sideways onto the wing, right? The wig, of course, is not made of metal. It's not made of canvas, as Wilbur made his wings, uh, covering over a structure. The wings are made of muscle and feathers. And so the sideways on look at the wing is very important because the wing has to be able to support the bird and the wing is basically an aerodynamic structure. This is a white-tailed eagle from the Isle of Mull, and this actually shows the huge curvature of the wing at the front of the bird. And this is another bird, the red kite, taken by a friend of mine called Colin Mitchell. Here it is in a steep dive for its meal uh, that uh, really shows the tremendous prowess of uh, flight in nature. Did birds emerge from reptiles? Did, they, did something like this lizard gradually emerge feathers, as some books seriously teach? Is that true or false, that the feather has the same fundamental structure as that of a reptile scale? The answer is no, it's false, because feathers emerge from a uh, what's called um, a, a sheath uh, and which is, is really a follicle, a bit like the hair follicles that we have. I haven't got many follicles on my head anymore, but you know, the hairs actually start from a follicle under the skin. But for a bird, it's actually a feather which is growing in that follicle and it's connected to flesh on the, out, uh, on the inside and then this feather grows inside the sheath or the follicle and then is placed carefully in the right place on the bird. So when you realize what birds are doing, they amazingly have these feathers growing in what looks like the, the covering of, a, 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 of a, a big pen, right? Imagine it like that. And then the feather comes out and it's placed in the right place on the bird. Then the follicle, which is incredibly thin on the bird, then falls apart, and it's just tiny little bits of dust which is left on the bird. And then the feather is in the right location and doesn't interrupt other feathers. So feathers, you can see here on a pigeon, you can see the little reflection to the top right of the picture. That is the follicles which the feather is growing out of, the sheath. And that sheath is very, very thin and just crumbles away when the feather is in the right place. Feathers are a marvel of lightweight engineering, which you only see under the microscope. This is what you actually see. You see tiny little barbules coming out from the barbs, which are different on one side than on the other, such that you get hooks which are on the left of the barbs. Well, I'm oh, sorry, it's, it's actually on the right of the barbs that, as we're looking at this picture. But as they're growing, they're on the left of the barb. They have hooks on. And then those barbs, barbules, which are growing on the right of the barbs as they're growing, have ridges. So the left-handed barbules grip the ridges of the right-handed barbules from an adjacent barb. So if I get somebody come out, perhaps one of the young children would like to come and show me, uh, or join me rather. Well, any child? Yes, would you like to come and join me? Yes, the, the, the girl at the front. You can both come, I don't mind. You come as well as, yes, the girl there. Yes, young man. What's your name? Uh, Vincent. Vincent. Vincent, if you'd like, first of all, just, can you just come back a bit, uh, young lady? What's your name? Charity. Sorry? 
Charity, charity, nice to, lovely name. Now I want you to do what I'm going to, what I'm doing, Vincent. So I'm separating the barbs, and then I join them back together again. I think I did this six years ago when I came. Um, so some of you may remember me doing this, but I can actually join them back again, and that's the structure that I'm talking about, which you can only see under the microscope. So you do the same thing, just separate them. Where? Right, now put your finger and thumb so you can see it's not just me doing magic, you can do it as well, right? So the feather is joined back again. Well, almost there, you haven't quite got it going. There we are, it's gone over. So this is a buzzard feather and we've both broken the barbs and Vincent has managed to get them back again. So it's not me doing magic, is it? You sit down and I'll now do it with charity. You have a go. So it's not a male thing. Even, I won't say even, I shouldn't be naughty. The, the ladies can do it. They'll probably do it better. There we go. Yeah, that's very good charity. It's a lovely name, by the way. It's a beautiful name. Thank you. So you understand? Give them a clap. Yeah. So a feather is a marvel of lightweight engineering, right? And once you realize that there is intricate engineering right down to the, right down really to the microscopic scale, it makes you wonder at what God has done. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. And this is going to be highly relevant to now considering how birds fly great distances, which they do. Some of them fly enormous distances. Let me just take you to another verse, which I haven't put on the screen. But if I could just take you to Proverbs chapter 25, you might turn to it and note it in your Bible. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 2 says this. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. Right? Remember this, it's the glory of God to hide something or to conceal a thing. Then it says, but the honour of kings is to search out a matter. Why do I say this? Because it's only in recent years that people have understood how birds fly enormous distances. Sometimes it's not so enormous, but it's remarkable because birds, like tiny little hummingbirds, still fly an enormous distance for them. It may only be a few hundred miles, but for a tiny bird, it's a big thing that they are doing. United Airlines, I hope, has a better flight planning a system than what they had a couple of days ago where they couldn't get one flight attendant to come to our aeroplane so it left it enormously late and disturbed lots of people's plans including my own. But I'll forgive them, they do usually get me there safe and sound eventually, right? But modern airlines have to have flight planning and FAA rules are there for a reason. A modern cockpit uses most sophisticated equipment to keep track of position. For flight planning, if you're involved in aviation, anybody a pilot here? Anybody a pilot? No, okay, I had the privilege actually in Denver of staying with a pilot and his wife, and he's thinking of going into uh, missionary flying. Um, he's not sure yet, but uh, he's, I went up in his light plane, he took me up to Scott's Bluff, we were thinking of going to the Crown Canyon, but it was clouded over. But uh, he's, uh, he, he's a very careful person. He has to tell, well, actually sometimes you don't have to tell um, the controllers necessarily, but he usually does tell them what his plans are, where he's going, just in case something goes wrong. But obviously with commercial aviation, you've got to file a flight plan. So you need a map, you need a compass of some kind to tell you where you're going, or tell you your direction rather. 
you need to have some idea how far you're going because that's going to affect the amount of fuel you need. That applies even to when you go on a land journey, but it certainly applies when you're dealing with aviation. Birds fly with actually an amazing consistency with those four principles. Map, compass, how far you're going, and how much fuel you need. Just bear those points in mind as we consider some remarkable journeys that take place. We could talk about the European swallow. I don't know whether you have an American version of this bird, but the swallow has a beautiful tail and beautiful colouring. They don't fly at enormous speeds, but they migrate at about 200 miles a day. Neither do they go um, a huge distance because of their speed each day. Um, they fly, though, eventually, after a good number of weeks, uh, they fly across the Sahara Desert, which is a very, uh, which is a very harsh environment. They manage to cross it, most of them do, but some of them die from starvation, exhaustion, and in storms. Some of them even fly right down to the tip of South Africa, which is a massive distance of something of the order of eight or 9,000 miles, coming back to England and northern parts of Europe. They fly through western France, across the Pyrenees, down eastern Spain, into Morocco and across the Sahara. And as I've just said, some don't make it. I mentioned the hummingbirds. Hummingbirds uh, pre are preparing to migrate long distances in the summer. The need to feed takes on an even greater urgency when they do that. They require increasing their original body weight of 25 to 40 percent. But if I tell you that in normal conditions, a hummingbird anyway replaces its own weight every day, just in normal conditions. So when they're migrating, they have to put in even extra nectar into their bodies in order to uh, make the journey of about 600 miles. The rufous hummingbird uh, crosses this very desert where you live. I don't know whether you realize that, but it's a lovely little hummingbird which crosses this desert, which is pretty difficult for it to do because it's a good few hundred miles to cross. The ruby-throated hummingbird flies across the Gulf of Mexico, which is about 600 miles non-stop. It weighs in at the fraction of an ounce. They are the smallest, one of the smallest birds, and they have the highest oxygen consumption, and they burn fuel so quickly that the travel of 600 miles across the Gulf of Mexico is a real challenge to them. So that's why I think you do need to be aware that you have to take account of the type of bird which is migrating. Before you give them, we would say the biscuit, but you misuse that word biscuit and you call it a cookie, right? But before we give the cookie to the bird that flies the longest distance nonstop, I think we should give credence to the little hummingbirds which fly for them great distances in order to migrate to their feeding grounds and to their breeding grounds. But let me now go to the ones which do fly much greater distances. Um, you call this bird the red knot. We call it the sandpiper. But anyway, <laughs> they fly 9,000 odd miles during their yearly migration between the Arctic and their wintering grounds, which are either in Central America or some of them go as far as the southern tip of South America. They are very attractive birds. Here's a, a picture of one on the uh, flats of the beach, beach areas. So they will go right up to the northern Canada for their breeding grounds and then 
when the weather begins to deteriorate, they'll come down to Delaware Bay and then go all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, which is way down in the south. But notice this, that their, their journeys may be of the order of four or 5,000 miles, they, but before they do their long journeys, they, they gobble up hard-shelled prey completely whole, sh hard shell as well. And they di digest it with a heavy duty stomach or gizzard and that relative to their body size is the largest of any shorebird. But then, notice this, that over the course of one week, a red knot or a sandpiper halves the size of its stomach. Now, um, without embarrassing you, are you able to do that? Can you halve the size of your stomach at will? Birds can. They can change the size of their other organs as well, such that everything goes into being compartments for fuel for their long journeys. This is staggering stuff. Some of you will have heard of the Pacific Golden Plover. That migrates between northern Canada, sometimes Alaska, and Hawaii, a distance of 3,000 miles, non-stop, over open ocean. Have some of you ever been to Hawaii? Put up your hand, you've been to Hawaii? I've been to Hawaii. Hawaii is a group of islands, of course. You've got the, the main island, then you've got other islands like Kauai, which I've been to, which has the Naupali Cliffs, which are very, very striking, beautiful island, perhaps a bit away from all where most people go to, which is Honolulu. Anyway, those islands, if you get your direction wrong, you could completely miss them if you don't get your direction right. Okay? Now here comes the real big issue. How are you going to get there? Remember, you need a map, you need a compass, you need to know how far you're going, you need to know how much fuel to take. But here comes another issue. Did you know that the Pacific Golden Plover adults, having laid their eggs and they've hatched the little ones, they leave the little ones behind and they go away first. And the little ones, having never been to Hawaii before, know where they're going, know how much fuel to take, and get to Hawaii after their parents. How do they do it? It has not yet been fully understood. Proverbs 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. But, shall you complete it with me? The honour of kings is to search out a matter. There is a godly principle of doing research in the Bible. Whoever thought that God anticipated doing research for his glory, and it's there in the book of Proverbs. The best way to do research, as Kepler illustrated when he made that famous statement, is to realize that you are thinking God's thoughts after him. We, therefore, as families, need to grow a godly seed, as it says in the book of Malachi. Children who will give glory to God in their generation by being good scientists and standing for the truth of God's word. We need missionaries in the academic world to stand for Christ and to do things for his glory. Yes, I know we need missionaries to get the gospel out right across the world, and I'm all for that. But it may be that some of you are called to go into academia and to do it deliberately for the cause of Christ and the gospel. That in all things, Colossians 1.18, even in academia, that in all things... He, Christ, might have the preeminence. You get it? So I'm not here just trying to tickle your brains with interesting facts. 
I'm interested in promoting Christ in the next generation. I'm very burdened for this, as perhaps you realise, and I'd make no apology for it. But I want to see young people trained in the things of God and to give glory for God in their generation. It's, it is said of King David, I forget now who said it, and I can't remember exactly the reference, but it says, he served the Lord, I think it's in the end of one, one or two Samuel, that he served the Lord in his generation. And I believe we should be having it in our minds to have young people raised to serve God in their generation. I don't know when Christ is coming back, do you? But I know he's coming back. But that doesn't mean that I have a fortress mentality and a sort of thing, right, okay, I'm going to clear out, just go and live in the Mojave Desert in a, in a little hut, you know, with, a, with very little, and just that's it, you know, Lord's coming back. No, no, that's not the spirit. We need to train our young people to stand for Christ and to use their talents effectively for God in their generation. I really believe that, friends. I think we are sometimes missing the real issues that the reason why some young people don't go on, humanly speaking, is because they feel, well, you know, everybody else has done it, and, I, and what I do is irrelevant, you know. I've got, no, I'm, I'm nothing. Actually, they are, they, they have got a lot to offer. We need to actually feed their minds with a sense of purpose. So this matter of the Pacific Golden Plover, it still hasn't been sorted out. Nobody knows yet what the answer is, but it's waiting to be discovered. There's the chemistry of the beetle waiting to be discovered. Am I enthusing any young person here? Write to me and I'll gladly enthuse you more, okay? And there are others perhaps in this fellowship. I've spoken with David, he's very keen, and there's others like Pastor Lynn. And I know that you, you understand what I'm saying. Now, let me tell you another thing. These Pacific Golden Plovers sometimes do what the Canada geese do, which is, I think, yes, this is Canada geese shown in this picture, which actually, you can see, are using a special V formation, which means that, as a group, they use less energy per capita than flying on their own. And the reason is that the top ones, the, the, the first one's doing the most work, right? He's actually got some trailing, spinning air coming from behind him, okay? The next bird comes along and picks up this updraft from the spin coming from their wings. And uh, uh, because it's doing that, okay, then that's the bird's up there, the first bird. And this bird puts its wings there and it gets a little kick from the spinning air from the first bird. And the third bird does the same, right? And so it goes all the way back. Sometimes they're in a diagonal line and then they form another diagonal line and the poor bird at the front's doing even more work, all right? Ah, but they have a little clever little ruse. The one at the back, after a little while, then takes the place of the one at the front and the one at the front moves down and so they do this and they gradually change such that overall everybody's doing roughly the same amount of work. By doing that, that means that they can actually cross the open ocean using a little bit less energy and they can make sure that they get to Hawaii without too many problems. But the big issue is how do the young ones know where to go? And how do they know that they've got to actually uh, uh, get enough fuel, which of course is fat, in their small bodies? It really is something still awaiting to be solved. If you thought that was wonderful, now get this. There is an even greater wonder. The bristle-thighed curlew doesn't just go to Hawaii. Oh, no, no. It says, no, I'm going for my holidays to Fiji. Now, Fiji is even further away. 
it's 5,000 miles. And again, the young birds are on their own and they find the tiny islands of Fiji in the vast Pacific Ocean. Have you ever flown across the Pacific? Well, I have a number of times. You fl you've done it, have you? Are you putting up your hand? Is that what you were doing? Right, okay. Oh, were well, you just pulling up the needle? <laughs> I think you are pulling up the needle. Okay, but, but to fly from Sydney to Los Angeles takes quite a long time. And there's basically nothing there. It's just water. But of course, there is these small islands. So it's a phenomenal journey that these birds are making. And as I say, the young ones, not knowing and not having done the journey before, know where Fiji is, so they've got a map. They've got a compass which is able to work out their direction. They know where they are on the map, okay, or where they're going, where they're going on the map as well. And they get the right amount of fat. If you get too much fat, you're going to be too heavy and you might not make Fiji. If you don't eat enough, you don't have enough fat. And for a different reason, you don't get to Fiji. You've got to have the right amount of fuel, the right amount of fat. Well, that is an amazing journey. And that, of course, is done nonstop. The Arctic terns are the ones which probably grow the greatest distance. They complete a round trip of, as the name suggests, going from the Arctic to the Antarctic. And they do the complete round trip once every year. So they build up quite a number of air miles, don't they? But 25,000 to 30,000 miles each year and it means that the oldest known arctic term which was about uh, which was banded and found to be 34 years old could have accumulated over a million miles in its own lifetime and in other words it could have flown to the moon and back twice in order to reach each year its destination. Okay, it's not doing that non-stop and sometimes hawks and peregrine falcons are waiting for these birds as they come through the Mediterranean. But it's still a remarkable journey, isn't it, that they do. And that is a lovely bird. I don't know whether you've seen Arctic terns, but they are really beautiful. They're not that very big. They're about, what, two feet, two feet long, maybe a little bit less. And then they're quite small birds, they're very, very beautiful. So that bird is certainly worth giving a big clap for, a wonderful clap. Well done, Arctic Turks, right? But the glory, of course, goes to the creator who made them. Now we'll deal with the one who, other than, we mustn't forget the little birds like the hummingbirds, and I'm coming back to them in a moment but the bird that's got the longest possible journey non-stop. The one that takes the cookie, as you would say, or we would say takes the biscuit, is the bar-tailed godwit, right? Now you can see, what, you can see that the bar-tailed godwit has, uh, has a, a beak which curls upwards. Okay, it's a bit like a curlew, but it's not a curlew. It's, uh, it's, it curls upwards. And it makes a journey of the order of 7,700 miles across the Pacific from Alaska right down to New Zealand. That's quite a journey. That is a real journey and a half. And it does it non-stop in six days across the Pacific. Here's a picture of the bar-tailed godwit. It's a beautiful bird. It's a bit larger, it's a bit more like two and a half feet, almost a metre long, if you include the long beak. Um, actually, that was in 2004, they said 7,700 miles, but then there was one found, Cassell's bar-tailed godwitch, which travelled 8,100 miles, so that one did even better. Then they studied some uh, birds which sadly had collided 
with um, not a wind farm, what did they collide with? They collided with a radar dome, sadly that some birds died in their journey, and the autopsy showed that the birds had tiny stomachs, or gizzards as they're called here, tiny livers, tiny kidneys, and they'd reduce their guts to a mere minimum. These birds are doing incredible things. They are compared by this uh, investigator, Robert Gill, of the US Ge Geological Survey, USGS. He likened them to flying softballs, which is quite a good illustration. The fat accounted for more than half of the just-launched Godwit's body weight. So in other words, when they were coming to the end of their journey, they'd lost half of their body weight. Or, and it wasn't quite the end, but it was not, not far from the end of their journey, their proposed journey. Sadly, they died because of their collision. Now I'm going to put some mathematics up, right? Please don't think that you need to understand all the mathematics. I mean, I could have said that Nathan will give you a test which I'm sure he could do, and he could mark it afterwards. But uh, this is the formula. Don't worry about it if you don't understand it. It doesn't really matter. But perhaps you could just re see the last line, which says that the distance y is proportional to the speed, right? Can you see that? y is equal to u divided by x. What is x? x is the mass loss per hour, okay? And for a bar-tailed godwit, it's about, just think of it as roughly half a percent per hour, right? So in 24 hours, think of it as roughly 25, okay, it will have lost how much? So one day, in other words, it will have lost what? Well, if you work it out, it's, it's going to be something like, uh, well, say, yes, so it's, it's half a percent per hour, uh, per hour. so on um, uh, 10 hours, it would have lost, um, oh dear, I'm getting wrapped up by my own logic, but it would, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's losing a half percent per hour, so it's using one percent every two hours, right? So it's going to lose something in the region of 10 percent, just a bit over that, per day. And it's going to be quite, quite an issue, isn't it? It might just, it's going to be roughly in that region. So it's going to lose an awful lot. Over 10 days, it's going to be almost completely gone, you know. It's not going to last longer than about 10 days when you work it out. So, there, in order to get across the Pacific, it's got to be a very good flyer, and it's really right at the extremities of its possible range. Now, there is another term here, which is LN with one plus F inside it. Don't worry too much about that, but for the engineers here, that is what we call a logarithm, which means that there is a weak dependence, but it nevertheless is a dependence, that if you eat too much, um, then you're not actually going to increase your range much, and you're going to actually risk not it getting there because you're too heavy. So. If I put up a graph here, maybe you'll begin to understand why I'm saying this, that the range actually doesn't increase hugely when you start increasing your obesity and how much you're eating. It can actually work against you in the end. And if I now put up a little plot here, this is where I'm going to bring back in what I am said earlier about the hummingbirds. The bar-tailed godwit is there, that third bird down, but if you go down one, two, three, four birds down, you'll see the mention of the ruby-throated hummingbird, which loses not half a percent per hour, but loses a body weight at an incredible two percent per hour. 
which means that after one day of 25, let's just multiply it by 25, you will actually have lost 50% of your body weight, right? So the ruby-throated hummingbird, because it's losing so much weight per hour, it, it's doing an amazing feat to travel 600 miles across the Gulf of Mexico. So please give a bit of a cookie to the ruby-throated hummingbird. It does exceedingly well. But just to show you this one, which is the bar-tailed godwit, just watch this film with me of the way these people are astounded. They're not believers, they're just naturalists looking at the bar-tailed godwit. But it really does make the point extreme, extremely well. Just watch this video with me. Yes, it's a she. Beautiful big bill, straighten that leg out. Ah, she wants to go. This is a bird so, that's flown as far as out. the moon. So, ah, she's been caught before. This one's been caught here before. She's been She'll round be and round the world 13 eight, times. So how old could she be? Well, she could be 15, 20 years old. And in one that. epic flight, she's come here to Miranda, New Zealand, almost 12,000 kilometres non-stop. She spent eight days without feeding, without drinking, uh, flapping all the time, not going to sleep properly, maybe switching off one side of the brain and keeping the other side active. This is unequivocally the longest known flight of any bird in the world. From Alaska to New Zealand and back again every year. A remarkable journey for an unassuming little bird. We think of them as ours but they're really just here on mud flats all around New Zealand to get fat over summer. <laughs> Very fat. They're clinically obese. 50% of their body weight may be fat. Before flying to the Arctic to breed. They have to somehow combine extreme obesity with extreme athleticism, which is something that humans can't do. That's shrinking your... Why do godwits get so fat? Last year, biologist Phil Batley was part of an international team that found the birds fly non-stop further than was ever thought. They implanted satellite transmitting devices into females, then tracked one all the way from the Coromandel Peninsula to northern China. Seven and a half days, 10,000 kilometres up to the Yellow Sea. So that's a truly huge flight. And then on to Alaska, where she stayed for five months, the battery in her satellite transmitter still working. Late <laughs> August, she headed back, flying non-stop all the way to Miranda, the same mudflats she left from. That little godwit, known as E7, made news around the world. I expected her to do it. I mean, we'd been working with this migration for a long time, and it was heartwarming to see it all happen. Uh, it was like one of these... Yes, you did it. You confirmed it, you know. So I think we ought to give... Those people were astounded, weren't they? You could see it in their eyes. But shouldn't we be even more astounded and give glory to God? Because in Jeremiah chapter 8, I think it is, it says this of the birds, right? If I can just find it. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at getting uh, quickly the verse. I'm sorry, I should have put this up. But in Jeremiah chapter 8, it says, and I think it's verse 7, it, it says, and it's a rebuke, really. It, it actually says, The stork in the heaven knows her appointed times. And the turtle, it should really be the turtle dove. That's what it's referring to here. It's not referring to the turtle, although turtles do migrate. And the crane and the swallow observed the time of their coming. But then it says this. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. In other words, God refers to migration with a rebuke to his people. Saying, these birds know more than you do about being aware of the times in which they live. And that's a big message for us as Christians. We need, there's a spiritual lesson here, we need to read the signs of the times and close with our Saviour and walk with him. And as I said in the first talk, to cleave unto him. I said that from Deuteronomy. 
just read it this morning. And I wonder whether you are really cleaving to the Saviour and are looking at what's going on in nature with a sense of, yes, wow, what you have done, Lord. But he says in his word that we're to learn lessons from nature. It's not the only book which re refers to animals. Uh, Job says that, uh, that we're to learn from the beasts. Let the beast teach you, it says in the book of Job. Now, look, th this, let me just deal in closing, if I may, Nathan. I've just got a few more minutes. I know you're hungry and you're going to let the trap door open in a moment. But, but let, let, me just sort of, let, let me just sort of close off by saying, how do these birds do it? Because remember I'm saying, I want some young people to go into this and to research and stand for God's glory. This is a small bird called the Manx Shearwater. Somebody let it out in Boston to find the tea that you dumped there. But uh, it, anyway, it didn't find the tea. But it, was, it flew home to its home because it knew that the best uh, tea was in Wales. And it flew home. It flew home to Wales. Sorry, I couldn't resist it. 3,200 miles in 12 and a half days averaging 250 miles per day across open ocean. That's pretty good going. And I think we should give them a clap, even if United Airlines let me down. So, so this Manx Shearwater got back. Now, how did it do it? Well, there is a number of issues going on, but this is what's recently been discovered. Only recently, not long ago. In 2021, uh, a Russian gentleman and some other people wrote a paper which was produced in Current Biology Number 31, I'll put up the reference in a moment, called Navigation by Extrapolation of Geomagnetic Cues in a Migratory Songbird. And what they discovered was that amazingly the birds actually sense the magnetic field of the Earth using ferrous, uh, ferri uh, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a magnetic, slightly magnetic substance which they have in their beaks. They sense the intensity of the magnetic field, they sense the inclination of the field, and I'll explain it with a diagram in a moment, they also sense the declination of the magnetic field. This is getting complicated, I know. But it is a complicated matter. Navigation is not simple. There's the reference, if you're interested in it. You can actually dig out the paper and read it for yourself. All right? So that came out in 2021. Now, let me explain what's going on. This is the field lines. Sorry, did you want the reference? I'll put it back up again. There you go. Somebody wanted to take it. And if you want to take a picture of that, you're welcome to do so. Um, the field lines of the magnetic field, let me just show you what the magnetic field looks like. It looks like a great big bar magnet, okay? Search that the magnetic north pole, right, is attracting your compasses, the north part of the magnetic uh, a magnetic field which your bar magnet is sensing, which is basically what a compass is doing, actually points northwards. We all know that. Okay, that's, that's fairly simple. But probably what you don't realise is that as the further north that you go to, right, suppose you're going towards Canada, then if you were to allow that, 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 uh, that compass just to sort of to dip, as well as to twirl round, okay, you'd actually notice that it would start inclining downwards, such that if you were over the magnetic north, it would be pointing right downwards, okay? So the birds are able to sense latitude, which is these lines going around the Earth. If they're beyond the equator, it's going up, right? So they know that they're either north or south. So they not only know where magnetic north is, they know where they are in terms of latitude. 
but there's one measurement missing because they can't pinpoint themselves unless they know where they are. West to east, which is not latitude, but longitude. Now, longitude is a big problem. At the time, the world's best navy in the 1700s was <clears throat> uh, the British Navy, which I think you came into collision with on, uh, in certain times towards the end of the 18th century. There was a bit of a tiff going on between us. But anyway, just ignore that just for a while. All right? But the British Navy had lots of problems because they couldn't work out where they were going west-east. Well, along came a gentleman who said, well, if I could measure the time, what it is, uh, w w both locally and in London at the same moment, then I can work out where I am West East. Well, that uh, got solved. And indeed, that is for a long while what people did to have very good clocks or chronometers which were used to solve that big problem of knowing where you were longitude. But that's not what the birds are doing. The birds are not measuring time. Would you believe it? What they're doing, and I'll, go, I'll give you this slide, which will perhaps help you, is that you can see here magnetic north is different to geographic north. So the magnetic north isn't actually at... Geographic north. What is geographic north? Well, this is a complicated point, but I hope, I think most of us can understand this. The world is actually like a revolving sphere, okay? It's a revolving sphere. And it is actually revolving around an axis, right, which is basically exactly halfway between sunrise and sunset. And that's what the birds know. They know where geographic north is. But magnetic north is a different location and it's to do with what I've just been saying about the magnetic field. And the magnetic north is not at the same location as geographic north. Would you believe it? The birds know the difference. And the difference changes as you go west-east. Because if magnetic north, which gradually drifts, by the way, but if magnetic north is in Labrador, right, and I'm over in Siberia, then the difference, that angle of difference, I know this is complicated, but I don't, I don't apologise for it because it's just amazing, the birds are sensing it. That angle is different there than if I'm in North America and I'm looking at the difference between magnetic north and geographic north. And the birds know it. And it's just incredible. They actually have shown by experiments with little songbirds where they just play around with the magnetic field that the birds know the difference and are able to sense it. And this just absolutely blows my mind that birds can do it. I could say more, but I'm going to get thrown off the podium in a moment. But I could say more and to say to you that I'll just briefly say that your monarch butterflies also do an amazing migration. Again, sensing the magnetic field. And by the way, the monarch butterfly uses one generation to come back to the south, and it's in a tiny little valley in Mexico where they all hibernate in the winter. And then they take about four generations to go either eastwards or westwards, coming up through California here. Uh, but I do like to say that you thought that the monarch butterfly was the best one for the greatest distance. I'm afraid you're wrong. The one that takes the biscuit is the, or the cookie, as you might say, is the painted lady butterfly, which is European. And that takes the longest journey of all butterflies because it actually flies, like I said, the swallows do, across the Sahara Desert. And it involves six generations of butterflies going north and one generation, like the monarch, coming all the way back to Africa where it winters. That is just amazing what's going on in the uh, flying world. I could say the same 
about the swimming world, turtles migrate. I could say the same about Atlantic salmon. They are not sensing the magnetic field as far as we know, although some of them may be, but they are certainly sensing even the smell and the taste of the water to bring them back to the specific location where they were born. The wonders of migration give glory to God. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. But the honour of kings, and may I just add in, king's children and king's grandchildren and king's descendants, because we are all princes and priests, as it were, in God's family. God loves us, and he wants to see his name glorified in a godly seed. So may we give glory to God for what he has done in the wonders of migration. Thank you. Well, finally it's time for Din Din's, so there you go. Questions you may have. I don't know if you just want it for questions. By the way, this, just while you're thinking, there's fossils here. If the children want to have a look at the fossils, they are welcome to look at them in the lunchtime. Yeah, quick question. Yeah. Uh, no, as far as we know, it's a magnetic compass, which is to do with ferrite, which is an iron oxide, Fe3O2, I think is the formula for it, um, in the bill of the birds. That's where it's been found. Thank you for the question. Yes, David. Of that line. So they see the sun rising. Right, and they sense the revolving of the sphere of the world, and they see the sun setting, and they know it's the angle in between. So they know where true north is. And if you are, if you can, if you want to press that, I don't know all the detail, but I know they sense true north, obviously from the motion of the sun. So they know. We spoke a little bit about the owl. The yeah. Why should the birds migrate? That's a very important question, and thank you for it. Uh, because it's interesting that some birds of the same species do not migrate. They get their food nearby. Other birds from the same species do migrate, and nobody's quite worked out why. So we don't fully know the answer to why. All I can say is that, that it could be that some birds, right, have carried genetic information due to the epigenetic pressures after the flood, okay, way back, generations ago, such that that has switched on, I don't know, genetic material which drives them to say, well, ancestrally, we always went south to get, to get, better food supply or better breeding grounds, and they carried on doing it. I would, I would suggest to you that there is some genetic pressure from the past which has been passed on. There is such a thing as epigenetics, where environment can switch on genetic behavior. There is a richness in the bird um, genetic makeup, just as we have a richness in our makeup, which can put could switch on genes and switch off genes. It's, it's always been there. And people are discovering that it's nothing to do with evolution. It's to do with switching on parts of the genome to operate in a certain way. But I'm, that is speculation. I can't prove that with the birds. Well, yeah, there is that possibility. Yeah. God has obviously put his hand on the way birds are behaving to his glory. Yes. Yes. Is it the angle of the sun uh, that triggers them to, to migrate? Is oh, yeah. In terms of the triggering of migration, it's well known that the shortness of the day has an effect on all natural creatures which are going preparing to migrate. So the, the, uh, uh, the, the, um, the godwits, for instance, know that their time 
in Alaska is coming to an end as both the temperatures drop and as the days shorten and they you're heading towards you know darkness for a long period so they know it's time to move guys so they make that journey all the way down to New Zealand meanwhile they feed and feed and feed and become flying softballs as was mentioned by the chap called Gil thank you for that yeah one last comment or is that it should we go and get our our your our feeding frenzy for migrating yeah go on David Yeah, that was, um, um, oh, I, I've got. Was, it, um, was that a normal flight path, or was that just, do you think it's totally out of its normal um, It was taken out of its normal territory and sent to Boston. For some, I don't know why they chose Boston, but they did. Perhaps it was a joke. But uh, <laughs> yeah, knowing all about the history. Um, yeah. It's uh, Manx Shearwater. So it looks like a, a small albatross because it's got very wide wings relative to its body size. So it's a Manx Shearwater. And that is, as the name suggests, Manx is a reference to the Isle of Man. And it's found in the island just off Wales and off Cumbria in, in where Wales meets England. That's, that's where the Manx Shearwater has its habitat. So both Wales and the Isle of Man is where you usually find it. So it was taken deliberately to Boston and released and they found that it could, it could sense where it was, which is an incredible point. It knew where it was on the magnetic map and it knew which way to get home. Just like homing pigeons did the same in the American Civil War. They were sending messages using pigeons. If I, I remember rightly, I've read that. And for a long while, pigeons were used in warfare because they knew how to find their way home and take messages before the days of telegraph and so on and communications today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll carry on at uh, two, did we say? Somewhere around two, I think we're going to start again. Or is it, uh, no, half past one. So we've got about 40 minutes to have our feeding frenzy. There you go, thank you. But your gizzards, you can't make half size.